Why are you talking to that candle? One of the cooks asked her one day. When you light it, you talk to it. She held a match to the wick of the orange candle and with her other hand sprinkled a little bit of salt onto the flame. You tell it what you want it to do. What's the black candle for? The cook asked. Black candles were burned when you wanted someone to die. She burned these candles most frequently. Welcome to the Extraordinary Stories podcast. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories with me, Barry Henderson. This podcast is a place where you will hear some of the craziest stories you've ever heard. Each episode, I will be taking you through a new story, be it true crime, extreme survival, stories of deceit, tangled webs of lies, truth, uh, sometimes just the outright weird. It can be murder, wrongful convictions, secrets unearthed, and really all that lies in between. This podcast is a place to hear those stories you just find utterly delicious. Uh, Stories are incredibly important to me. Um, A good story, an extraordinary story, gets me really excited. And at that point, I just want to share it. Okay, let's go. Today's story is that of a woman called Anjette Lyles. So this story takes place in Macon, Georgia, USA. And we're in the 1950s at this point for this story. Macon is a town with 100,000 people and it's described as a slow moving town and a place where the food is described as the food that mother used to make. Macon was a very unique community a friendly place where you stopped and you talked to people on the main street and you knew the goings on of everyone's brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers and and you took the time to stop and ask how they were and keep up to date with all the news that's going on. Now the place I grew up in was actually not too dissimilar to this, a little place called Nilston. Um and yeah, it's this it's sort of same idea. So you would meet people and they would know your family and they would know this cousin and that particular person. And, and yeah, okay, so it was a nice, nice sort of community feeling. It's said of Macon, it has more churches and white column houses than any other surrounding cities. There is an annual cherry blossom festival when the town is turned pink. They paint, thing, they paint everything in the town pink. And they have their very own nominated pink lady. I mean, that sounds great. I'm not entirely sure what the pink lady does, but I've got this great image of a woman in a sort of bubblegum pink outfit walking around and greeting people. I don't know. I don't know what her actual uh, duties as the pink lady of the town would be. Now, right in the heart of the town, on the main street, was Anne Jett's restaurant. A hustling and bustling restaurant which was popular with everyone in town. In the spring of 1958, there were four mysterious illnesses in Macon. And that town was about to be put on the map. Let's talk about Anjette. Anjette Lyles was born 1925 and she was one of the most well-known, well-liked and popular people in town. Words used to describe her include vivacious, beautiful, smart, charismatic, gracious and funny. Vivacious comes up again and again and again. Every sort of description that I read of her, vivacious just seems to be the word that um, 
was most used by people really to describe her. So keep keep in mind um, just just how how many people described her as vivacious. Okay, um, a resident judge um, in Macon said of Anne Jett, she was a gorgeous woman. She shined and she sparkled. One of the restaurant cooks said, everyone loves her. She's just the sweetest person. Um, a regular who used to go to Anne Jett's restaurant would tell a documentary maker years later that going to her restaurant, you didn't think about the food as much as you thought about just being welcome. She hugged everyone's neck as they walked in the door. She would come to each table and sit down and talk. She had a personality that was terrific. It was a pleasure to go to her restaurant. You just couldn't help but like her. This restaurant was Anjet's entire world. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Anjet's look because, um, yeah, I think that plays a big part in who she was. She's described as bold, beautiful and effervescent. She was glamorous and she would drive around town in fancy cars, exuding elegance. Um, She was described by one of the residents as just breathtaking with her blonde hair, fancy dresses and elegant style. Okay, let's get to the story. Anjit Lyles was born 23rd of August 1925, born and raised in Macon. As a young student at school, Anne Jett was described as fairly unremarkable in terms of her academic abilities, but she was described as pretty and possessed a charming personality that enabled her to bend people to her will. Even as a child, she usually got what she wanted. And I think that's a particularly ominous phrase to say about someone, that even as a child, she usually got what she wanted. So that will become important in the story of Anne Jett as we, as we move through it. Okay, in 1947, she married Ben F. Lyles Jr. So, the restaurant that I was talking about a second ago was actually owned by her husband. At this point, it wasn't her restaurant. It was actually his. Um, this business had been given to him by his father. So at this point, Anjet was working in the kitchen. She was helping her husband, who was managing the place, the staff, the finances, etc. Very much so, Anjet was the face of the restaurant. Um, the couple had two daughters. They had Marsha, born in 1948, and Carla, born in 1951. Before too long... Anjet began to step out of the kitchen and she and Ben would really run this business together with, as I said, she was very much the face of it. She was extremely popular and when customers came, she would just make them feel so welcome. She would tell jokes, she would tell stories um, and people really enjoyed her presence in the restaurant. It was a part of why you went to this restaurant was to see her. So everything's good. Okay, there's money coming in, they've got two lovely daughters, and they're a happily married couple. Okay, now something strange happens. Anjet's husband Ben begins to suffer from really bad health. He's admitted to Macon Hospital, and his symptoms are listed as the following. Swollen extremities severe stomach aches, bleeding from the eyes and the mouth, fever and a stiffening of the bones. The onset of liver failure. Okay, so at this point, doctors are utterly perplexed. They cannot figure out a diagnosis. The symptoms don't seem to add up to any sort of clear illness which they can treat. Now, they eventually say that Ben has encephalitis. Never heard of it. And I think this was a committed decision by doctors, simply because they couldn't arrive at a clear answer, but they felt that they had to offer some sort of a diagnosis for what was wrong with him. Within two weeks, and with Anjet at his bedside, Ben Lyles dies. Obviously, 
this leaves her absolutely devastated. Now what Anjet didn't know was that just prior to his health failing, he had actually sold their restaurant. Why he did this and why he never consulted Anjet isn't clear. Now I've searched and I've searched and I've watched documentaries and I've read books and I just cannot figure out why he sold it. The most that I can turn up is that he was overheard by someone saying, I've just had enough. However, what the actual root of the reason is, I don't know, except that Ben Lyles is dead and Anjet finds that the restaurant has been sold. So she's now aged 25 and she's a widow with two small children. So she found work in another local restaurant and saved as much money as she could. She, at this point, also cashed in Ben's life insurance and in April 1955, she bought back the restaurant and renamed it Anjet's. So this is her now. So she's finally in the place where this restaurant, which, as I said earlier on, is her entire world, is now her own. So Anjet's quickly became the most popular restaurant in town. It was already popular, but with Anjet fully in charge of it, it became the absolute place to be. And she was now positioning herself to be one of the most visible people in town and a thriving businesswoman. Her clientele included businessmen, judges, civic leaders and everyone else in Macon who would come just so that they could have a coffee, have a cake, have some food in Anjet's. In reading a few articles, I found this statement. Anjet was a headstrong woman who often stretched the boundaries of acceptable behaviour in the small southern town. And what this really means is that at the time she was linked to lots of married men in the town. And the rumour mill placed her firmly as a woman who, as well as being incredibly well liked, had to be watched around married men. So at this point, if you're so inclined and you haven't done so, look up an image of Anjet Lyles and, and see what she looks like. I think by 1950 standards, she certainly was a beauty. She's certainly not unattractive. She seems to dress well and there's there's a real look of confidence in the images of her. She just seems to exude this kind of confidence in every photograph that you see of her. In the late spring of 1955, Anjet began seeing Joe Neil Gabbert, who was a pilot for Capital Airways. He had apparently, so the story goes, visited the restaurant and as he was paying, he told Anjet he was going to marry her. She laughed and he said with certainty, mark my words, I will make you my wife. And he did. They married soon after meeting and it looked like Anjet's life was getting back to normal after the death of her first husband. However, two weeks, yes, two weeks into their marriage, her new husband took ill. His symptoms are described as a skin rash which ended up in open sores all over his body, severe abdominal pain, fever and constant nausea and the onset of liver failure. Now, of course, Anjet was at his bedside But doctors, once more, could not find a diagnosis. And unfortunately, he died. So how are people feeling towards Anjet now? Lots of people feel sad for her. Feel really sorry for her. She's aged 30 and she's widowed twice. However, one resident said of her, she was no grieving widow. This wasn't everyone's opinion. Some people offered her support. I think my thing at this point is, Nobody was suspicious. Perhaps a couple of people were, but no one was really doing anything about it. But I think at this point, she's had two dead husbands, both of which have died in agony without there being a diagnosis, a clear diagnosis as to what's actually making them ill. I don't know. Maybe that says more about me. I mean, I'm not really a suspicious person, but mm, I think at this point I'd be wondering... Okay, what's going on here? Would you not? Anyway, 
So with the money she received from her second husband's life insurance, she bought a new car and a new house. Now the restaurant at this point was booming. Business was better than ever and Anjet was in her element playing the hostess. Soon after she acquired a new house, her first mother-in-law, Julia Lyles, moved in with her. The elderly Mrs Lyles was lonely and she wanted to be close to her grandchildren. Mrs Lyles also spent much of her day at the restaurant and she would help Angie out as much as possible. Now going through some of the older woman's possessions while she lived with her, Angie discovered a bank book which revealed that her mother-in-law possessed a considerable, considerable amount of money. She was far, far wealthier than Angie had actually realised. So she began pestering uh, Mrs Lyles to make a will. Mrs Lyles refused to do so. Now it was around this time that people began talking about Anjet's superstitious behaviours, as they called it. These superstitious behaviours included visiting fortune tellers frequently. She would use herbs and homemade remedies to cast spells. Well, spells, I don't know. I don't know if she thought she was a witch. Um, she would uh, light candles and she would whisper to them. And it wasn't uncommon for the restaurant staff to find her burning candles in the kitchen and speaking to the flames. In August of 1957, Anjette's bad luck continued and her mother-in-law, Julia, fell ill. Her symptoms included severe abdominal pain, constant nausea and headaches. Now her daughter-in-law stayed with her and cared for her during her month-long hospital visit and this earned real admiration for Anjet for the devotion that she was showing to her first mother-in-law. Julia died in the hospital with Anjet by her side. One week later, Anjet produced what she claimed was her mother-in-law's will in which much of the estate had been left to Anjet. It wasn't until her daughter Marsha grew ill in the late winter of 1958 that townsfolk became very suspicious of all of the deaths surrounding Anjet Lyles. Let me repeat that. It wasn't until Marsha grew ill that people started to become very suspicious. I mean, seriously? So... What do you think happens next? Is it possible that Marsha was admitted to hospital with undiagnosable symptoms? Correct, of course. Her symptoms included abdominal pain, swollen extremities, extreme nausea and hallucinations. During the two weeks in hospital, whilst doctors tried to figure out the child's illness, again not able to get to a diagnosis, and yet did something that would send people absolutely crazy. She ordered a coffin for her daughter. So people began asking, why is she so sure that her daughter won't recover? How can a mother be so resigned to death? Is it that she just assumes because every time she takes someone to the hospital that they never get back out, that this is just going to be another death? Or does she actually know that her daughter is never going to make it out of that hospital? Residents in Macon would later describe Anjet's behaviour towards her two daughters as extremely ugly. She would scream at them in the restaurant and was often heard saying, keep quiet or God help you, you'll be sorry. People said that the children lived in fear of their mother. Restaurant staff would have to sometimes look after the girls in a way that kept them out of the way of their mother as much as possible. Horrifically, Marsha died on the 4th of April 1958. God, she was just a child. It's absolutely horrible. Okay, at this point, the tide was finally turning on Anjet and people began to whisper in the town that she was probably responsible or had a lot to do with the deaths 
which continued around her. So at this point, the body count is four. Two dead husbands, one dead mother-in-law, and one dead child. But, 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 this is what Anjet didn't know. I really like this. She didn't know that an autopsy had been performed on Marsha's body. Basically, the doctors at this point were asking police for help, as this was the fourth body to come through their hospital and die without ever, ever really reaching a proper diagnosis. So, the autopsy takes place, and in her system, they find large amounts of arsenic. Georgia detectives decided at this point to exhume the bodies of Ben, the first husband, Joe, the second husband, and Julia, the mother-in-law, And guess what they found? Large doses of in their systems. Arsenic, arsenic, arsenic. A search of Anjet's house at this point turns up several boxes of ant poison containing arsenic. Along with uh, lots of other stuff that they refer to as voodoo paraphernalia. Candles, written spells, potions, powders and roots. So at this point she's questioned by police. But quite loosely, they weren't really directly accusing her. They just wanted to chat with her. They just wanted to sort of find out what had been going on. So, nothing too serious. Yet, in an attempt to provide an answer about the arsenic, Angie marched into the police station with the youngest daughter, Carla, and said, OK, you tell the police officer what you told me. Now Carla then tells a story at this point that she and her sister had been playing at doctors and that she'd given her older sister some medicine. Angie at this point produced a bottle of ant poison. But police were not buying this um, and they dismissed Angie from the station at this point. Okay, so at this point the town is buzzing with gossip and stories and people pointing the finger at, at Angie. But ironically, all this did was just made her restaurant more popular. People were, more people than were already going to the restaurant were now flocking into this restaurant, which I just find, I find really odd. I find it really strange that there's a woman in town who you think may have poisoned four of her family. And you think, do you know what? I think where would we go for lunch? I think we'll definitely go to that restaurant today. I don't know. I just think that's very strange. Anjet seeked the help of a local judge she knows very well, she knew very well, sorry, called Judge Taylor Phillips. And he recounts the short conversation they had, um, which I really like, it makes me laugh. It goes like this. Judge. Anjet, you're going to need a lawyer. Anjet. Okay. Will you represent me? Judge. Absolutely not. Anjet. Why? The judge says, Because I'm pretty sure you're as guilty as homemade sin. (laughs) I really like that. Guilty as homemade sin. Okay, so on May 6th, 1958, she is arrested. She's charged with four counts of first degree murder and a trial is arranged. At this point, it's said it was difficult to get a jury in Macon. Because not only did almost every single person know Anjet, but she was related to a large number of people who lived um, in the town. And people were divided. Some knew her for such a long time that they felt she couldn't possibly be guilty. Others were as entirely sure as Judge Taylor Phillips put it, that she was as guilty as homemade sin. So the trial begins. The courthouse is described as packed to the rafters, with press, locals and police. The prosecution put forward a great case which stayed away from all of the voodoo side of Anjet's life. Um, They felt that that would just muddy the entire case, but instead that they had enough facts that they could rely on to, to get a conviction. They said she had means, motive and opportunity in each murder. Money, they said, was her main driving force. Each of the victims had a life insurance policy which Anjet received after their death. 
In the case of her mother-in-law, Julia, it was proven that the will that suddenly appeared a week after her death had, of course, been forged by Anjette herself. So the damning evidence put forward. A cook in the restaurant told the court that Anjette would take food and drink to the patients while they were in the hospital. But before delivering a drink or any food, Anjet would disappear into the restroom for a few minutes, taking with her the food, the drink and her purse. The doctors treating her daughter Marsha told the court that when Anjet's daughter was in a hospital bed crying out from a hallucination, she was seeing snakes and thinking bugs were crawling out of her fingers, Anjet, standing nearby, did not attempt to comfort the dying child, but instead laughed at her. Laughed. Laughed. Fucking maniac. Absolute maniac. Two weeks before her daughter died, Anjet packed up the girl's things, which were in the hospital room, put them all in a suitcase, put it outside of the room and said, well, she won't be needing these things anymore. I mean, what? Another cook from the restaurant recounted this conversation. She asked Anjet, Why are you talking to that candle? Anjet replied, When you light it, you talk to it. She then held a match to the wick of the orange candle and with her other hand sprinkled a bit of salt onto the flame. You tell it what you want it to do. The cook asked, What's the black candle for? Black candles are burned when you want someone to die. And these were the ones she burned most frequently. So the case looked solid for the prosecution. However, the defence had one thing up their sleeve, something they felt would absolutely be Anjet's ticket to freedom. It was Anjet herself. Of course, let's just go back. She's vivacious. She's charming. She's funny. So they believed charismatic Anjet could take to the stand and convince the jury of her innocence. So she was allowed to make an impassioned speech to the jury in which she stated she was the victim who'd been dealt some bad cards in life and that death was unfortunately following her around. She claimed she had nothing to do with the deaths and that the arsenic found in the bodies was just pure coincidence. The jury retired. People said in that time that uh, during the jury deliberations, Anjet was her bright and outgoing self. She was making people in the courtroom laugh. She was talking about the new house she planned to buy and the car she had her eye on. However, that was short-lived. The jury returned within one hour. The verdict? Guilty. Anjette was found guilty of four counts of murder. She was stunned. She really believed that the people of Macon would find her innocent. She was taken to a cell and awaited sentencing. The following day, the judge presiding over the case sentenced her to death by electric chair. This was the first time anyone had ever seen Anjet Lyles cry. She openly wept in the courtroom and had to be helped out of the room by two police officers as she could barely stand. Now in the 1950s uh, in Georgia, the law around the death sentence was very complicated and the rules were changing at that time. Anjet Lyles would have been the first white woman to be hung and many politicians weren't happy that this was happening on their watch. So whilst this was being debated, Anjet's lawyers took this opportunity and they acted quickly. They brought in private psychologists who visited her in prison and she was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. What this meant is that she wouldn't be executed, but instead she was transferred to the local mental health institution. Hilariously, guess where she worked when she got there? In the kitchens. 
Why? <laughs> Why would you give this woman a job in the kitchens? I don't know. I just don't understand that. In 1977, Anjet Lyles died in this institution. So, what happened to the restaurant? The restaurant remained open for a few years afterwards, still bringing in great money. Tourists and others who'd read about her flocked to eat at Anjet's. However, nowadays, the restaurant no longer exists. Okay, so ends the story of Anjet Lyles. So, what do I find interesting about this story? Well, there's two sides to every story. Sometimes there's three sides, four sides, however many you want. I guess, interestingly, I think, why was she not caught sooner? What, what is it that didn't make people act quicker? Why, why, was, why was there not... When suspicion was growing by the time the second husband was dead, why were people not acting quicker? I don't know. I guess the first thing that I think of is it's that idea of when we talk about um, Ted Bundy or we talk about John Wayne Gacy or any of these people who are described as oh, they were so charming, but they were just such lovely people. You could never have guessed that they would have done it. There's no way that person could have been a murderer. I don't know if that's what we had here with Anjet Lyles, if that was a case of, but she's just so vivacious. She's so charming and everyone loves her. Not sure if that's what it was. I mean, was this really just about money with her? Was it control? Was it mental illness? Was there a mental illness there that was at play? Not sure. Anjet gets described in lots and lots of the literature as a sociopath. You know, it's said that she had no feelings of guilt or remorse for her actions. Is this possible? Mm, Certainly, yeah, could be. Many people will say that, yeah, there's a chance she was suffering from a mental health issue, but it wasn't being a paranoid schizophrenic. That was a bullshit diagnosis to just escape the death penalty, basically. I don't have all the answers, but I find the story of Anjet Lyles absolutely extraordinary and I hope that you did too. Okay, that's about it from me, except to say that if you want to reach out to me, you can do it in the following ways. There is a Facebook group and it's Extraordinary Stories Podcast. On Twitter, I'm at Extra Stories Pod. I'm on Instagram, you'll find me there, it's Extraordinary Stories. Um, What I'll do is I'll put up a few pictures and a few links to some stuff about Anjet Lyles and you can, uh, yeah, you can have a look at her. You can can see the pictures of of all the players in this case. Um, If you want to email me, you can do so and I would really love to hear from you. It's uh, extraordinarystoriespodcast at gmail.com. I'd really like to hear from you. Thanks so much for listening, and if you know a story worth sharing, then let me know. Okay, goodbye. It didn't, it didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs>
Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over.